The 1960s and 70s was a very transformative time for the motorcycle industry, with Japanese-made bikes bringing the beginning of the end for British-made motorcycles. Before the 1960s, there really wasn't any motorcycle segments or genres. There were just motorcycles and scooters. If you wanted to go off-road, for example, you basically had to buy a British or American bike, then strip it down and add some knobby tyres. This was the era which defined motorcycle genres. So let's look at the bike which was the very first sports tourer. The bike which started the sport touring segment is undoubtedly the BMW R90S, which was introduced in 1973. Powered by a 898cc air-cooled flat twin, which produced 67 horsepower, it featured twin front disc brakes. The auto carbies, which was a first for BMW, and a new style of fairing which incorporated all of the instruments into the cockpit as well as the clock and ammeter. A ducktail rear fairing also provided a small storage space underneath. The standout feature, however, was a very unique airbrush paint scheme in either two-tone metallic silver and grey or Daytona orange. There was no other motorcycle like it, but it was more than double the price of most other motorcycles. It could match performance with most bikes of the era and maintain near its top speed of 125 miles per hour all day long. The addition of hard panniers and either a rack or over the cylinder toaster racks made the bike a capable solo or two up sports tourer. It was indeed one of the most significant motorcycles ever made. Which bike was the very first adventure bike? Many of you may wonder what this particular bike is doing on the list. Please just bear with me and you'll find out. Introduced in 1976, the Yamaha XT500 was a single cylinder 500cc thumper, producing around 28 horsepower. Hardly groundbreaking I know. It also lacked luxuries like an electric start, but it was extremely reliable and fast, with a top speed of 90 miles an hour making it the first motorcycle to truly nail the idea of an all-round adventure bike. Most people seem to have forgotten, or just don't realise, how great a bike the XT500 was. In fact, when the first Paris-Dakar was held in 1979, the Yamaha XT500 took both first and second positions. Then the following year, it filled the first four positions, the very first and much larger capacity BMW R80GS, which is often considered the first adventure bike, finished in fifth place. This laid the blueprint for Yamaha's legendary Tenere adventure bikes, which were to follow in the years to come. Nowadays, every manufacturer has a large capacity all-rounder in its model range. This true dual-purpose bike was indeed the very first adventure bike, although, of course, at that time, nobody knew it. The very first full dress tourer was the 1965 FLH Harley Davidson Electroglide. To emphasise its touring capabilities, optional packages like a large factory windscreen, hard lockable saddlebags were available, as well as a buddy seat, with a handrail to replace the standard spring mounted seat. The combination of its huge weight, which was around 750 pounds, and the plush front and adjustable rear suspension, made it the smoothest motorcycle on the road by far. Along with the addition of an electric start came 12 volt electrics to replace the previous 6 volt system, which was much more reliable. Two spotlights up front vastly improved the depth of illumination at night. A choice between hand or foot shifting of gears was available. The standard exhaust system had both cylinders exhausting to the right into a single muffler, but an optional dual exhaust system with fishtail mufflers was available. 
the motor was 1,212 cc's and the last of the pan heads. It produced 55 horsepower and the bike had a top speed of 100 miles an hour. This stylistic motorcycle laid down the formula for all large touring motorcycles which others were to imitate many years later. At that time it was the most comfortable, mile leading motorcycle in the world. The Electric Glide was indeed the very first full dresser touring motorcycle, capable of taking both rider and passenger on extremely long journeys in luxurious comfort. The very first pit bike was the Honda Monkey, which was initially designed for an amusement park in 1961. It proved to be popular with park visitors. Its compact design meant adult riders would have their arms and legs sticking out and they were described as looking like monkeys, hence the nickname of Monkey Bike and it was soon adopted. They came with a 49cc 4-stroke engine which produced around 3 horsepower. The handlebars were collapsible, folding down by loosening a couple of knobs to make it compact enough to stow away easily in the trunk of a car. Initial monkey bikes didn't come with any suspension at all. It wasn't until later that front suspension was added and then later on rear suspension. The 49cc engine was paired with a 3-speed transmission with an automatic clutch. Later models had a 4 speed. Top speed was around 30 miles an hour, depending on how much ate for dinner that is. And despite the presence of mainly lawnmower engines in mini bikes during the 1950s, it was not until the mass production of the Honda Monkey Bike that mini bikes became commonplace. I mean, who doesn't want a pocket sized motorcycle? The term pit bike was first used to describe the Honda Monkey by race event staff who used the bike to get around the pit areas of different race tracks. But it wasn't long until the public caught on and began to see the potential of these little pit bikes. The quickest version of the 50cc monkeys was the Honda Z50R, which had an overhead cam. Adored by children and loved by adults, the Honda Monkey quickly became a family favourite and spawned an entirely new motorcycle genre called pit bikes, which are so popular today. The very first super bike. After spending many hours doing research, this proved to be a very difficult and controversial genre to decide on a definitive bike. Apparently, there is no universal definition of the term superbike. Typically though, a superbike is a street legal motorcycle, but more like a racing bike than a road bike, and usually around 1000cc's or thereabouts. They are optimised for extreme acceleration and pure speed, and have little or no regard for the rider's comfort. In layman's terms, this basically means an extremely powerful motorcycle of large capacity with a head down, ass up riding position. I would be very interested as to what any of you watching this video think of this description of a superbike. If this description is indeed correct, the very first superbike was not the Honda CB750 nor the Kawasaki Z1900. The very first superbike must have been the MV Augusta 750 Sport of 1971 as it featured fully adjustable clip-on bars and a factory race-inspired full fairing. It was truly a stunning motorcycle with standout red, white and blue paintwork, matching red frame and a red vinyl seat. The loud twin megaphone exhausts ensured the MV would never be missed. However, the bike was unbelievably expensive at three times the cost of a Honda CB750. The four-stroke 743cc engine had gear-driven twin overhead camshafts and was able to meet the needs of any motorcycling speed enthusiast without having to undergo any special tuning whatsoever. The motor produced over 70 horsepower and with a top speed of over 140 miles an hour, it was the world's most powerful motorcycle at that time. No! However, it wasn't a very refined motorcycle. Its four Delorto carbies sucked unfiltered air and had no choke. Instead, each float bowl had its own tickler for starting. Generally the motor would turn over several times before finally hearing the roar of all the four cylinders firing. The initial burst was sometimes followed by the motor nearly cutting out as the fuel from the flooded carbies was burnt and it was sometimes necessary to continually use the starter motor to maintain firing. The engines were individually hand built with each component selected for a perfect fit. 
and despite having shaft drive, the 750 Sport could show its heels to every vehicle on two or four wheels at that time. The front brakes initially fitted were duo duplex drum brakes, the best of that era. But after 1973, this was changed to dual disc brakes. It handled like a proper racing motorcycle too. Unlike its only other four-cylinder competition, the Honda CB750, the MV was also much faster. The only bike around at that time that had comparable handling and speed was the Ducati 750 Supersport, but they didn't come onto the scene until 1972. And the Kawasaki Z1900 of the same year certainly had the speed but lacked the handling of both the Italian machines. The MV Augusta 750S was, if the description mentioned previously is indeed accurate, the very first superbike. This bike, the very first road trail bike, was a bike which anyone could afford. It's the incredibly versatile Yamaha DT1 of 1968. It featured a 246cc two-stroke engine which produced 18.5 horsepower and gave the bike a top speed of 71 miles per hour. At that time, other road trail bikes were little more than a street bike with trials tyres and a high mounted exhaust pipe. These scramblers were okay for venturing on the gravel roads but little else. The DT1 was firstly and foremost a dirt bike but it came standard with lights, turn signals and full instruments, which were designed to be easily removed for competition use. There was no longer any need to mix petrol with oil either, as the bike featured the Yamaha Auto Lube injection system, which automatically adjusted the mix ratio to suit. It was the bike that introduced many people, including myself, to off-road riding and ignited the dirt bike craze that we all see today. To complete this list with the very first factory custom cruiser, I'm going to have to sneak forward just a tad out of the 70s to the year 1980. Damn, you suck! But I'm quite sure a few of them were manufactured in 1979, so technically I'm still in the same era. The bike I'm talking about is the Harley Davidson Wide Glide. This original FXWG model was absolutely a groundbreaking motorcycle. The most notable part of the Wide Glide was the front end, and to achieve this factory chopper look, Harley increased the rake to 33 degrees, meaning the forks could be longer. The addition of a skinny 21 inch front wheel and a tiny headlight and the double disc setup added to the look. On such a narrow front tyre, twin discs weren't that good of an idea. However, Harley overcame this by using the most ineffectual brake calipers in existence, so locking up the front wheel was never a problem. Another change to make the front end appear even longer was the addition of buckhorn handlebars, sitting on top of 4 inch risers. The first year of the model also featured the most unique paint job in history with classic orange and yellow flames which were hand painted. 1980 would be the very last time that the AMF logo would sit on top of the Harley Davidson bar and shield too. Following a Harley management buyout, the AMF logo got ditched from every model. Lastly on the list of the Wide Glide innovations were the forward foot controls. While some of the other models had highway pegs, the Wide Glide was the first to move all the controls forward as well. So if you wanted a chopper and you didn't want to go to all the trouble and expensive building one, the Wide Glide was the only show in town. The bike had Harley's shovelhead 1337cc engine, which produced 67 horsepower, and was good for a top speed of just over 100 miles an hour. These old shovelheads vibrated, and they vibrated a lot, which for me just adds to their character and charm. The very first factory custom cruiser was without doubt the 1980 Harley Davidson Wide Glide. Lastly, and just for a bit of fun, what was the very first truly fully customised road bike ever made. Of course, it just has to be the Bat Cycle, from the original TV series in the 1960s. The Bat Cycle was used in both the 1966 film and all three seasons of the TV series. The motorcycle used was a Yamaha Catalina YDS3, with a 250cc twin cylinder two stroke engine and a sidecar. The sidecar included a detachable 55cc go-kart for Robin, which he deployed to help get him out of his own tricky situations. Even though this model was an excellent bike in itself, that produced 27 horsepower with a top speed of 86 miles an hour, and it could probably run the rings around most bikes twice its capacity at the time, I doubt Batman and Robin ever actually caught many criminals using it. Still, it is a very impressive customization, don't you think? If you enjoyed this video please take the time to subscribe and don't forget to click the notification button so you get notified of any new videos I produce. Cheers, thanks for watching.